Now let's examine Chapter 17, The Endocrine System. First, let's compare the nervous system to the endocrine system. The endocrine system and nervous system are similar yet very different. Both systems rely on the release of chemicals that bind to specific receptors on their target cells. Both share many chemical messengers. When released into the bloodstream, they are called hormones, but when released into a synapse, they are called neurotransmitters. Both systems are regulated primarily by negative feedback control, and both share a common goal, to preserve homeostasis by coordinating and regulating the activities of other cells, tissues, organs, and systems. The endocrine system works in har with or in harmony with the nervous system to control and coordinate all of the activities of the body and to maintain homeostasis. And there are various mechanisms of intracellular communication that facilitate this process. Direct communication occurs via gap junctions, uses ions, small solutes, and other lipid-soluble materials as chemical mediators. The effects are usually limited to adjacent cells of the same type that are interconnected by connexins. Paracrine communication is via extracellular fluids and uses paracrine factors as chemical mediators. The effects are primarily limited to the local area where paracrine factor concentrations are relatively high. Target cells must have appropriate receptors. Endocrine communication is via the bloodstream and uses hormones as chemical mediators. The effects are on target cells located in other tissues or organs. The target cell must have an appropriate receptor. And neural communication is via synaptic clefts and uses neurotransmitters as chemical mediators. The effects are limited to very specific areas and target cells must also have the appropriate receptor. Here you can see the general overview of the endocrine Before we get into the endocrine system in further detail, let's look at hormones. Hormones are chemical messengers released by endocrine cells or glands into the bloodstream to be transported throughout the body to regulate the metabolic functions and activities of other cells of the body. Hormones can be of amine, peptide, protein, or steroid in their structure. Hormones and paracrine factors are divided into one of these groups. Amino acid derivatives are hormones derived from a single amino acid, such as the thyroid hormones thyroxin and triidiothyronine. Peptide hormones are short chains of amino acids, and an example might be antidiuretic hormone composed of nine amino acids. Proteins are long chains of amino acids or polypeptides. You can have small proteins like insulin, which is composed of 51 amino acids, or glycoproteins like thyroid stimulating pro a hormone. Lipid derivatives consist of carbon rings and side chains built either from fatty acid chains or cholesterol. Econosoids are a subclass of lipid derivatives and they are built from fatty acid chains and include the leukotrines and prostaglandins. Steroid hormones are built from cholesterol molecules and include testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone, corticosteroids, and calcitrol.
hormone binding uh, lipid soluble are shown here. And these hormones go directly through the plasma membrane and have their receptor located in the cytoplasm or nucleus. Steroid hormones and thyroid hormones are transported across the cell membrane and bind to receptors in the mitochondria or the nucleus and exert their effects that way. Other hormones like the protein derivatives must be transported across the plasma membrane via a channel or carrier. The binding of lipid soluble hormones is shown here. The lipid soluble hormone diffuses through the plasma membrane. The hormone binds with its receptor in the cytoplasm forming a complex. The receptor hormone complex enters the nucleus and can trigger gene transcription and then transcribed messenger RNA is translated into proteins that can then alter cell activity and exert their physiological effects. Other types of hormone binding are water soluble and this is where possible receptor locations might be on target cells. The receptor could be in the plasma membrane. Water soluble hormones cannot cross the plasma membrane and they act as a first messenger relaying their message to an intracellular intermediary known as a second messenger. The second messenger can then affect enzyme activity and have a variety of impacts on cellular metabolic reactions. These generally involve a G protein, which is an enzyme complex coupled to a receptor. The most um, notable example is cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP can increase many levels, uh, increased levels can activate many enzymes, open ion channels, or have a variety of impacts on cellular metabolic activity. Calcium can also act and generally function in combination with intracellular proteins called calmodulin to activate enzymes. Each of these second messengers would involve a biochemical cascade of impacts that would ultimately lead to changes in cellular metabolic reactions. Examples of water-soluble hormones and how they interact are shown here. A water-soluble hormone binds to a membrane receptor. That binding activates a G protein. The G protein may in this example, for, um, in this case, activate adenocyclase. Adenocyclase catalyzes the conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP, which is the second messenger. Cyclic AMP activates protein kinases, and then protein kinases can phosphorylate proteins in the cytoplasm, and this activates these proteins, allowing them to then alter cell activity. Now there is a variety of feedback mechanisms and hormonal interactions. Interactions between hormones can occur via antagonistic effects. Where one hormone inhibits the response of another, therefore they generate opposite effects. An example would be where insulin lowers blood sugar while glucagon raises blood sugar. Synergistic effects can also occur between two, or two hormones where they generate the same effect and therefore the result is greater than the effect that each would generate alone. An example would be ADH, epinephrine, and aldosterone all raise blood pressure. A permissive effect is where one hormone is needed to activate or enable another. An example would be where renin stimulates the conversion of angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Other features
feedback mechanisms for hormones involve negative feedback and positive feedback systems. Negative feedback systems are a physiological response that causes a decrease in the release of hormone. And this type of feedback mechanism is most commonly used. Positive feedback systems are where a physiological response causes an increase in the release of a hormone. And this type of feedback mechanism is rarely used. Now let's examine some of the endocrine glands beginning with the hypothalamus and the pituitary. The hypothalamus provides the highest level of endocrine control. It integrates the activities of the nervous system and endocrine system. The hypothalamus accomplishes this integration through three mechanisms. Hypothalamic neurons synthesize two hormones, ADH and oxytocin, and transports them along axons within the infundibulum to the posterior lobe of the pituitary for storage and secretion. The hypothalamus secretes regulatory hormones that control the secretions of the anterior pituitary gland. These regulatory hormones, called releasing hormones and inhibiting hormones, flow via a network of fenestrated capillaries called the hypophysal portal system. The hypothalamus also contains autonomic centers that exert direct neural control of the endocrine cells, called chromaffin cells, of the adrenal medulla. When the sympathetic division is activated, this direct control allows the in immediate stimulation of the adrenal gland. The hypothalamus pituitary complex is also a very important connection. The hypothalamus region lies inferior and anterior to the thalamus. It connects to the pituitary via the infundibulum. The pituitary gland consists of an anterior and posterior lobe. The pituitary gland is also known as the master gland and is located within the cella turcica of the sphenoid bone. Connected to the hypothalamus via the infundibulum and a network of capillaries called the hypophysal portal system. Let's look at the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. The posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, connected to the hypothalamus by the infundibulum, contains the axons of the hypothalamic neurons. The posterior lobe of the pituitary gland stores and secretes hormones synthesized in the hypothalamus. Antidiuretic hormone, ADH, also known as vasopressin, increases water reabsorption within the renal tubules of the kidney. This results in a decrease in water loss from urine. Oxytocin stimulates the smooth muscle contractions of the uterus, which initiates childbirth. After delivery, oxytocin stimulates the ejection of milk. In both sexes, oxytocin is known as the cuddle hormone as it surges during arousal and orgasm. The anterior lobe of the pituitary gland is connected to the hypothalamus by the hypophysal portal system, controlled by regulating hormones called releasing and inhibiting hormones from the hypothalamus. Here are the major pituitary hormones. Thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, targets the thyroid gland and stimulates the thyroid to grow and increase its secretion of the thyroid hormones T3 and T4. Released in response to thyrotropin releasing hormone, TRH, from the hypothalamus. Adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, stimulates the release of steroid hormones by the adrenal cortex. Released in response to corticotropin-releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. 
Follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH, promotes ovarian follicles to develop in females and, in conjunction with luteinizing hormone, stimulates the secretion of estrogens. In males, FSH promotes the physical maturation in sperm, released in response to gonadotropin-releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. Luteinizing hormone, LH, induces ovulation in females and promotes the secretion of estrogen and progesterone. In males, it stimulates the production of sex hormones called androgens, specifically testosterone, released in response to gonadotropin-releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. Growth hormone, GH, stimulates cell growth and reproduction by accelerating the rate of protein synthesis, particularly in skeletal muscle and bone. Regulated by growth hormone releasing hormone and growth hormone inhibiting hormone from the hypothalamus. Prolactin, PRL, works with other hormones to stimulate mammary gland development and the production of milk during pregnancy and during nursing. Regulated by several prolactin releasing hormones and prolactin inhibiting hormone and melanocyte stimulating hormone, MSH, stimulates melanocytes of the skin to increase their production of melanin. Here you can see the hormonal regulation of growth hormone. Growth hormone, as already noted, accelerates the rate of protein synthesis in skeletal muscle and bones, but does have a wide impact on the body. Here are the major pituitary hormones and their target organs that we just discussed. Now let's look at the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is located in the neck just below the larynx and anterior to the trachea, divided into a right and left lobe connected by a narrow isthmus, regulated by TSH from the pituitary gland. The thyroid gland contains large numbers of thyroid follicles, which are hollow spheres lined by a simple cuboidal epithelium called the follicle cells. The follicle cells surround a cavity that holds a viscous colloid, a fluid containing a large quantity of dissolved proteins. The follicle cells synthesize a globular protein called thyroglobulin and secreted into the colloid of the thyroid follicle. The thyroglobulin molecule, molecule contains the amino acid tyrosine. The thyroglobulin is combined with iodide ions absorbed from the diet to form the thyroid hormones T3 triidiothyronine and T4 thyroxine. Thyroid hormones have several effects in the body. They stimulate red blood cell production and thus enhance oxygen delivery. Thyroid hormones also stimulate the activity of other endocrine tissues. They accelerate the turnover of minerals and bone, elevate the rates of oxygen consumption and energy consumption in cells, thereby increasing basal metabolic rates, increase heart rate and force of contraction, which can result in increased blood pressure, increase sensitivity to sympathetic stimulation, and maintain the normal sensitivity of respiratory centers to changes in oxygen and carbon dioxide concentrations in the blood. Here you can see a classic negative feedback loop controlling the regulation of thyroid hormone levels. Now let's look at the parathyroid gland. Two pairs of glands embedded in the posterior surface of the thyroid gland are the parathyroid glands. They are composed of two cell populations oxyphil cells, which have no known function, and chief cells, which produce parathyroid hormone, PTH, 
which increases blood calcium levels when they are low. PTH and calcitonin work as antagonists to maintain homeostasis of blood calcium levels. PTH specifically targets bones to activate osteoclast, causing calcium and phosphate ions to be released into the blood, the intestines to increase calcium absorption from the blood, and the kidneys to promote activation of vitamin D and increase calcium reabsorption in the kidney tubules. Here you can see another microscopic view of the parathyroid showing the chief cells, oxyphil cells, and the thyroid gland. And here you can see the feedback mechanism of parathyroid hormone in maintaining blood calcium homeostasis. Now let's look at the adrenal gland. The adrenal glands are located retroperitoneal and superior to the kidney. Composed of two distinct regions, the adrenal cortex, the outer, and the adrenal medulla, the inner portion. The adrenal cortex produces steroid hormones from cholesterol and is divided into three regions. The zona glomerulosa, which is the outer portion, and this portion releases mineral corticoids, principally aldosterone, which controls electrolyte balance in the kidneys. The zona vasculata, which is the middle layer, produces glucocorticoids such as cortisol and cortisone, which influence the metabolism of glucose, protein, and fat and is controlled by ACTH. And the zona reticularis, which is the inner lining, produces androgens or adrenal sex hormones such as testosterone, which influence the masculization of the male. The adrenal medulla releases hormones when the body is under stress and consists of hormone producing cells called chromaffin cells. Epinephrine elevates blood sugar, regulates the body during stress or anger, raises blood pressure, heart rate, glycogen breakdowns, and increases all other sympathetic effects of the nervous system. And norepinephrine helps maintain blood pressure and accounts for about 20% of the hormones released by the medullary portion of the adrenal gland. And here you can see another view of the adrenal gland showing those various regions and zones we just talked about. Here are the effects of adrenaline, some of which we just noted. Look at the pineal gland. The pineal gland is located in the roof of the third ventricle of the brain called the epithalamus region. The pineal gland is composed of special secretory cells called pinealocytes. The major product is melatonin whose concentrations rise and fall in a diurnal cycle. Levels are lowest during daylight hours and highest at night. Melatonin appears to maintain the basic circadian rhythms, which are the daily changes in physiological processes that fall a regular day-night pattern. And here you can see the functions of melatonin. Melatonin also protects against tissue damage by acting as an anti antioxidant and protects the central nervous system from free radicals such as hydrogen peroxide. Melatonin may also inhibit reproductive development and functioning. Now let's examine the gonadal and placental glands. The ovaries are located in the pelvic cavity and produce estrogen which regulates secondary sex characteristics like breast and pubic hair. The ovaries also produce progesterone, which helps to stimulate the uterus to bring about thickening and vascularization of the endometrium 
in preparation for implantation of a fertilized egg. The testes are located in the scrotum and secrete testosterone, the male sex hormone, which brings about the development of secondary sex characteristics, normal sex behaviors, and the production of sperm. The testes also produce inhibin, which inhibits the release of FSH and GNRH when sperm counts are high. The placenta is a temporary organ only formed during pregnancy. It produces HCG hormone, human chorionic gonadotrophic, which aids in maintaining pregnancy and keeping the corteus corpus luteum intact. It also secretes relaxin, which softens the pubic symphysis to ease childbirth. Now let's look at the pancreas. The pancreas is located posterior and inferior to the stomach, a unique organ that has both, both an endocrine and exocrine ability. The islet of Langerhans are endocrine cells that... Here you can see the homeostatic regulation of blood glucose levels. Insulin and glucagon work as antagonists to maintain homeostasis of blood sugar. Insulin lowers blood glucose levels by enhancing membrane transport of glucose into body cells, converting excess glucose to glycogen for short-term storage, glycogenesis, and into fat for long-term st storage in adipocytes, lipogenesis. Glucagon raises blood glucose levels by breaking down glycogen into glucose, glycogenolysis, synthesizes glucose from lactic acid and other non-carbohydrate molecules, gluconeogenesis, and releases glucose to the blood by liver cells. There are other organs with secondary endocrine function that we will examine now. The heart secretes A and P, that literally means producing salty urine. A and P inhibits aldosterone release by the adrenal cortex. The gastrointestinal tract possesses cells that produce secretin, gastrin, CCK, GIP, VIP, and many more. The kidney secretes EPO for red blood cell production, renin for activation of angiotensin II, a potent vasoconstrictor, and calcitrol for the absorption of calcium ions. Adipose tissue releases leptin following the uptake of glucose and lipids, resulting in a feeling of fullness. The skin produces cholecalciferol, the inactive form of vitamin D. The thymus gland, which is located posterior to the sternum and between the lungs. It's very large in infants, increases in size until puberty, and then shrinks as we continue to age. The major hormonal product of the thymus gland is thymosin which appears to be essential for the normal development of T lymphocytes and the immune response. In the liver, um, thrombopoietin is produced for the stimulation of platelet production and angiotensinogen, which is used to activate um, to form other versions of angiotensin. Now let's examine the development and aging of the endocrine system. The endoderm produces the thyroid, parathyroid, pancreas, and thymus. The mesoderm gives rise to the gonads and adrenal cortex, and the ectoderm gives rise to the pituitary, pineal gland, and adrenal medulla. There are a variety of homeostatic imbalances of the endocrine system. A number of homeostatic imbalances are shown here, such as the
those imbalances that can occur with growth hormone, like pituitary dwarfism, which is hyposecretion of growth hormone during growth years. And this causes slow bone growth and premature closing of the growth plates before normal height is achieved. Treatment would include oral growth hormone therapy. You can also have pituitary gigantism, which is hypersecretion of growth hormone during growth years, leading to an abnormal increase of long bones. You can see an example of that here. Along with acromegaly, which is hypersecretion of growth hormone during adulthood, which leads to the bones, hands, feet, cheeks, and jaw thickening, and soft tissues can also grow. There's a variety of a number of other disorders associated with antidiuretic hormone, thyroid hormone, the adrenal cortical hormones, the pancreatic hormones that you should also review in the previous table. And finally, a goiter is shown here, which is an imbalance of the thyroid hormone and leads to an enlarged thyroid caused by an iodine deficiency. This concludes our overview of Chapter 17, The Endocrine System.